Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Professor. And welcome to another session of organic chemistry. In today's session, we are going to uh, start our discussion on chapter 11. And hopefully, we shall finish chapter 11 today. But before we do that, I do have a few announcements to make. I want to remind you that the uh, next class exam, that is exam number three, is scheduled for next Tuesday. That is November 19. Next Tuesday, November 19, that is exam number three. And because of that, we are going to have an online review session on Sunday, November 17, at 8 p.m. So mark your calendar for that. So online review session on Sunday, November 17, at 8 p.m. I will send you the link to that session and also remind you of that session. Um, Friday. I also want to remind you that the uh, own work assignment for this week has been posted and that will be the end of chapter 11 questions in all and that is also due on Sunday November 17 at 11 p.m. And finally I do not forget to complete the online survey that was sent to you and the deadline for completion for that survey is Thursday, November 14 at 11 p.m. So okay, let us uh, start our discussion on chapter 11. Chapter 11 is an extension of chapter 10 uh, because for the most part we are going to discuss the some of the chemistry of organoalides. Uh, specifically, we shall discuss the mechanism of sub substitution nucleophilic reactions and also mechanism of elimination reactions. And if we have some time after that, we might do some problems. Because on uh, the class on Thursday, we, we are going to do mostly uh, solving problems on Thursday in preparation for your for your exam and that of course that exam will cover the end of chapter 8 then chapter 9 chapter 10 and chapter 11 okay okay so let us start our discussion on chapter 11 as you can see here we are going to discuss our substitution nucleophilic reactions the mechanism of these reactions and also elimination reactions. As you can see, we also have two types of substitution reactions. We have what we call the bimolecular SN2 reaction, and then the unimolecular SN1 reaction. And with regard to the elimination reaction, we have the E2 reaction. E1 reaction, and finally, E1CB uh, reaction. So all of these we are going to discuss today. Okay, on this slide, you have a list of learning outcome objectives. I will advise that you should uh, visit this slide uh, in order to ensure that you have mastered uh, some of those important concepts and or topics uh, in this chapter. Okay, before we start our discussion on reaction mechanism, uh, what I would like to do now <coughs> is to go over a few uh, terminologies, in other words, a few of the organic chemistry uh, language 
uh, with regard to reaction mechanism. If you see on this slide, we have this molecule here. Of course, some of this terminology we have already been exposed to. Okay, this normally we will say this is the starting material. You have this organoalite reacting with water to give either this product here, which is an alcohol, or this product, which is an alkene. The point we made here is whenever you perform an organic uh, reaction, you will find that there are some competing reactions. Okay? Sometimes you may get substitution reaction at the same time as you are getting also elimination reaction. Now, what we do as organic chemists, therefore, is to find those conditions that will allow us to make, to pre uh, preferentially make a particular uh, product. Okay? And some of those conditions, of course, depend on the re what we call the reaction condition. For example, what type of solvent are you going to use? Here, in this reaction here, ethanol is used as a solvent. And also, what kind of starting material are you going to use? Here, what you have there, we have a tertiary substrate. Notice here, what, I, what we have there, This starting material here, we refer to this as substrate. Okay, so you are going to hear me say uh, substrate subsequently. And all, on the substrate, you have the chlorine atom attached to this carbon here. The chlorine atom, we say this is the living group because at the end of the reaction, the chlorine has gone. In this case, chlorine has been replaced by the hydroxyl group. So we say the chlorine is a living group. And of course, since the chlorine is attached to this carbon here, we say this carbon here is an electrophilic carbon. Because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, thereby pulling electron uh, to itself. So therefore, this carbon here does have some, and, uh, some partial uh, positive uh, character to it. Anyway, so we, instead of calling this a starting material, we call it the substrate. And of course, here, the water in this case, we say this is the nucleophile, because this nucleophile here eventually is going to attack this carbon here. Okay. So all of, this, <coughs> all of this affect or impact the outcome of reactions. Either the substrate, the nature of the substrate, the nature of the solvent, the nature of the nucleophile, and the nature of the living group. They do affect the reaction conditions. So what we are going to do now, essentially uh, highlight some of these uh, uh, effects of some of these uh, components in organic chemical reactions. Now let us start discussing uh, <coughs> the first set of reactions. We refer to this as substitution nucleophilic bimolecular reaction, and we call this SN2 reaction. As you can see here, we are starting with this molecule here, S2-bromobutane, and at the, at the end of the reaction, we obtain R, to butanol, in essence, the absolute configuration of this carbon here has changed from an R configuration that has changed to an S configuration. So you can see here there is a, there has been an inversion of configuration. Inversion of configuration. Now, let us now give you the mechanism of this reaction. Now, why do we call this SN2 reaction? Okay. 
Okay. <coughs> okay, let us look at the mechanism of this reaction. Mechanism of SN2 reaction. Okay. You notice here we are starting with the substrate here that is optically active. Uh, the reason we do that, we do that is to uh, demonstrate some of the important features of the SN2 reaction. Now, what do you have here? We have this here, hydroxide acting as a nucleophile. What does the nucleophile do? You can see the arrow is attacking this carbon here, the electrophilic carbon. Okay, at the same time that the nucleophile is attacking the electrophilic carbon, the bromine carbon bond is being uh, broken, so therefore the living group is living. So everything is happening at the same time. So as you are forming a new bond, we are also breaking the existing bond. Okay, so we have this, what we call a transition, a transition state, yes. Uh -huh. What is the reagent? Is there a reagent here? The reagent here is the hydroxide. Okay. okay, we call the nucleophile, yes. Okay. Okay. So what is happening here? In this reaction mechanism, everything is happening at the same time. You are forming a new bond, a new oxygen carbon bond, and at the same time you are breaking the carbon bromine bond. So we say this is a concerted mechanism. We say this is a concerted reaction mechanism, meaning that bond breaking and bond formation are taking place at the same time. Bond breaking and bond formation are taking place. at the same time, so we call this a concerted reaction mechanism. <coughs> now, you can see, so if I ask you to give the mechanism of this reaction, you don't necessarily need to give this structure of this transition stage, you don't need to do that. All you have to do here is show that the nucleophile is attacking the electrophilic carbon, and at the same time, the living group is living, and then the outcome of this here is this product here. We end up with the product in which the absolute configuration has been inverted. Okay? So that would be the mechanism. Now supposing we then want to draw the we want to draw the uh, reaction energy profile for this, for this reaction. Are you writing? If you have to draw the reaction energy profile for this reaction here, for this reaction mechanism, this is what it will look like. SN2 reaction. Okay, you have the energy here on the y axis, and on the x axis is the reaction progress.
Let's assume at this point we start with the the substrate and the nucleophile. Both of them are here. So the substrate, let us simply just use Rx to represent the substrate. Rx is here. And at the same time, you also have the nucleophile here. Here, <coughs> the tip of this uh, energy profile here, this is the uh, transition state, say Ts, which will be this structure here, yes. In the transition state, what is happening, the, o the, uh, the, uh, the oxygen is bonding to the carbon, and at the same time as the bromine is leaving. Okay, that's what we are showing here. Okay, so, and so the transition state <coughs> is this here, okay, at the point at which the uh, oxygen is bonded to the carbon and bromine is leaving at the same time. So what you have here, this particular reaction here has only one transition state, okay, and the energy difference between the transition state and the starting material here, this delta here, we say this is the uh, delta G, which is the energy of activation. That would be the energy of activation. Delta G, this case delta G for the transition state. That is the amount of energy that is required before this reaction can go. And of course, right here, you now have your final product. In this case, it will be your alcohol. That's your alcohol. <coughs> Now the energy difference between the starting material, in this case the substrate, and the product here, the energy difference between this here, okay, we call that delta G, So what is, this is telling us is that this reaction here, the net process of this reaction, you do generate energy. In other words, the product is a lot more stable than the starting material, okay? So this kind of reaction, you refer to this as an hexagonic reaction. <coughs> In which case, you are saying that the, the product of the reaction is more stable than the starting material, which is to say that this reaction does gener generate uh, energy. Okay. Now, if you not, let us go back and take a look at this reaction mechanism. The nucleophile, right here, and the substrate, they are here. And at the point at which both the nucleophile and the substrate are interacting with each other, forming the oxygen carbon bond in this case, and the bromine carbon bond is breaking. That step is what we call the rate the, uh, limiting step, rate limiting step. In other words, that is the rate, the step of the reaction that determines the rate of this reaction. In other words, that is the step that determines how much energy of activation you need. So we call this the rate limiting step. And because both the nucleophile and the substrate are present at the rate limit limiting step, we refer to this as bimolecular reaction. We 
we refer to this as bimolecular reaction. In other words, at the step in which the rate of this reaction is determined, that determines the rate of the reaction, both the nucleophile and the substrate must be present. And that is where you get the SN2 from. The 2 stands for bimolecular. It is a substitution reaction. It is also a nucleophilic reaction because in, it involves a nucleophile. So that is why you have the S and then the N for nucleophilic. And then the 2 simply tells us that the, at the rate limiting step, both the nucleophile and the substrate must be present. Okay, now, uh, given that information, if we have to do a kinetic study for this reaction, if we have to do a kinetic study for this reaction, we will say that the rate of this reaction, the rate law for this reaction is this here, some kind of constant, every reaction has a constant that is associated with it, multiplied by the product of the concentration of this, uh, the nucleophile and the substrate. In this case, let us represent the substrate as Rx and the nucleophile as Nu. Okay, so we say the rate law equation for this reaction is some constant multiplied by the product of the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of the nucleophile. So we say this is a second order reaction. Okay, because the rate uh, limiting step requires that both of those must be present. Say for example, let us assume that we have a reaction in which the concentration of the substrate is two moles per liter and the concentration of the nucleophile is two moles per liter. So what would be the rate of the reaction? Let us look at it. Okay, two moles per liter, let's put two here. Two moles per liter of the substrate and two moles per liter of the nucleophile. And what do we get here? Let's, at this point, let us just ignore the uh, constant. Okay, so we get four, the value of four for the rate of this reaction. Now supposing, supposing we double the concentration of the substrate. Supposing we double the concentration of the substrate. What will happen to the rate of this reaction? Double concentration of substrate. What will happen? Say we have this. Yes. No, if, I mean, if we just ask you, supposing we double the uh, concentration of the substrate, what happened to the rate of the reaction? So that can, that's the kind of question we will ask you. Okay, so, okay. <coughs> So we have this here. Okay, so we double this. So that becomes four moles per liter, right? And we keep the concentration of the nucleophile constant. What happens here? Becomes eight. So what happens to the rate of the reaction? It's double, right? Supposing we double the concentration of the nucleophile. What do you think will happen to the rate of the reaction? What do you think will happen to the rate of the reaction? What? It should double. Okay. <coughs> so we keep the we keep the concentration of the substrate uh, constant, which is two, 
This is the initial concentration here. And you double the concentration of the nucleophile. So now you get H. So what have we done here? We have doubled the rate of the reaction. Now what if you double the rate of the uh, substrate and you double the rate of the of the nucleophile? What do you think will happen? Exactly. Okay, very good. So you see that the rate of the reaction is quadruple. That is how we get to know the, uh, the what type of mechanism this reaction undertakes. Because if the rate does not depend on the nucleophile and the substrate, when you do all of these experiments here, you will find that if, for example, the nucleophile doesn't have to be present in the rate limiting step, then nothing will happen. To the, uh, to the rate of the reaction, if it does not depend, if the nucleophile is not present uh, at the rate limiting step. So the next uh, mechanism we are going to show that when we get to SN1 reaction. But for SN2 reaction, both the nucleophile and the substrate must be present. And therefore we say this is a second order uh, reaction, okay? So let, let us now give you a few examples of this before we go to the next to the next uh, reaction mechanism. And also, I'm sure the question you want to ask is, how do we know that this reaction, which is a, an SN2 reaction, or which is not an SN2 reaction? How do you know? Okay. Okay. To say condition for SN2 reaction. This is very important. Condition for SN2 reaction. One, the living group must be attached to group must be attached to either a metal group. or a primary carbon or sometimes a secondary carbon. Okay. So with regard to the substrate, those are the conditions for SN2 reaction. So therefore, supposing I give you this reaction here, Supposing I give you this reaction here, as a methanol reacts with this compound here to give this. Would this be an SN2 reaction? No. That would not be an SN2 reaction because SN2 reaction does not take place on a tertiary substrate. Okay, that would not be an SN2 reaction. So one of the conditions of an SN2 reaction is the starting at uh, the living group must be attached to all of this carbon that I showed here. For example. And it is in all the time that you have stereochemical implication in SN2 reaction. The reason I showed you a molecule with, with stereochemistry is just so that you begin to see the effect of the SN2 reaction. Supposing we have this. Okay? And then we have this product here. That would be 
an SN2 reaction. That will be an SN2 reaction. In which what is happening here, the hydroxide comes here, attacks this carbon here, and the bromine leaves. That's the mechanism right there. So this would be an example of an SN2 reaction. Okay. So one of the conditions for SN2 reaction is the carbon must be either a methyl carbon, a primary carbon, or a secondary carbon. The second condition is the nucleophile is most likely, I say most likely, negatively charged. Okay? An example would be your hydroxide. Your OH group. And alkoxide. That would be an ethoxide. This is an ethoxide. This is your hydroxide. Or it could be your acetate. The point here is for SN2 reaction, the nucleophile is most likely negatively charged. Condition number three. The solvent okay, needs polar aprotic solvent. What does that mean? Okay, of course the solvent is the medium through you mix the reactants and the reagent so they could react. Okay, the uh, needs a polar aprotic solvent. For example, if I have this, this is an example of a polar aprotic solvent. Let us use this here. Diethyl ether. This is a polar solvent, but it does not have acidic hydrogen. Okay, when we say aprotic, in other words, it does not have hydrogen that is acidic, with no no acidic hydrogen. Okay, what is an example of a polar protic solvent? The opposite is the polar protic solvent. Polar protic solvent will be an aqua, for example. This here is a polar solvent, but it has acidic hydrogen. This here. Okay, so you cannot. For SN2 reaction, you cannot use protic solvent. In other words, those solvents that contain acidic hydrogen. Okay. Uh, generally, for SN2 reaction, uh, you will use okay. Okay, typical solvent for SN2 reaction.
this here for acetonitrile this here dimethyl sulfoxide We abbreviate as DMSO <coughs> this here tetrahydrofuran we abbreviate as THF This here, dimethyl formamide, dimethyl formamide. which we abbreviate as DMF. And of course, that ethyl ether, this here. Well, you need to at least know the abbreviated uh, names, okay? So when you see this, you know that, okay, this most likely is an SN2 reaction. This is diethyl ether. These are some of the common uh, solvent for SN2 reaction. Okay. okay, so let us go to the next uh, type of uh, reaction mechanism. We are going to come back to SN2 reactions. Okay. <coughs> At least now you know what an SN2 reaction is. You know the condition under which you are going to have SN2 reactions. And let us take a look at what we call the substitution nucleophilic unimolecular okay which we refer to as SN1 reaction Okay. In the case of the SN1 reaction, let us say we start with this molecule here. Okay, once again, I want to start with a Cara molecule. Oh, by the way, one thing I forgot to tell you in that last one. Yes. I'll come back to that. What I was going to tell you, when if you start an SN2 reaction with an optically active starting material, the product you get will be an optically active product. Okay? Because all you've done is to invert the configuration. Okay? Remember that we started with an S substrate, we ended up with an R. So if you start with an SN2 reaction, if you start with an optically active substrate, then you are going to get an optically active product. Okay. Now let us come back to SN1 reaction. <coughs> Imagine that we use this here.
Imagine that we use this starting material here. Okay, this molecule will be, let me write it better than this. This would be three bromo. This would be if you are the, you could determine the absolute configuration here when you get home. But this is th uh, three bromo S three bromo. Three methyl. Exane. It is optically active. Okay. Now, if I now take a nucleophile, in this case, I want to use an alcohol for a nucleophile, or sometimes you could even use water. Let us take this alcohol here, methanol. Methanol is going to be a uh, nucleophile. At the end of this reaction, this is what we get. Yeah, so we do not confuse this. Let me use a different color for this here. Put the right here. Okay. So you get this product. You also get this product. Let's call this compound A and compound B. What do you think is the relationship between compounds A and B? They are enantiomers, yes. They are enantiomers. So therefore, in the SN1 reaction, what is happening here? In the SN1 reaction here, even though we are starting with an optically active starting material, by the time we finish, we get a racemate. which is a mixture of enantiomers, equal amount of enantiomers. So they're racemic. So what is, what is that telling us? It is telling us about the reaction mechanism. Somehow, we are losing the absolute configuration in order for us to get these two products. Keep in mind, in the case of the SN2 reaction, both the bond breaking and bond formation are taking place at the same time, so you couldn't lose configuration. But here, we are losing absolute configuration. And that is why we end up with two different products, two enantiomers. So therefore, what is the mechanism of this reaction? Okay, so let us take a look at the mechanism of this reaction. Are you still writing this?
ओके मैं किसे ऑफ एस एम वन रिएक्शन Once again, let us start with this molecule here. Let us start with the molecule of three bromo S three bromo. Three methyl. Let's say it again. The first thing that happens in the reaction mechanism. We are going to have cleavage of the carbon bromine bond. This bond will break heterolytically. So that you form a carbocation. So that now you form a carbocation. From this carbocation. And carbocations are sp2 hybridized carbon. Carbocations are sp2 hybridized carbon. Which is to say that on this carbon here, there is a vacant p orbital. Imagine now you have a vacant p orbital here. Okay, so the moment you lose the bromine, then you lose your stereochemistry, because the carbocation being an sp2 carbon is flat. Imagine that it looks like this, right? Think of this as a group. A group here, so the carbocation is flat. And what that tells us, a nucleophile could come from this side, or it could come from this side to get the fat to define our product. Okay, and that is how you end up with two enantiomers. The first thing that happens is the formation of the carbocation. Okay, so once you form this carbocation, then the nucleophile, in this case, which will be your uh, Methanol could either come from here or could come from here. Depending on where it comes from, you form the two enantiomers. And there is no reason to believe that it, the attack will be from one side more than the other side. And that is how, why you end up with a racemate. That's how you end up with a racemate. So now you get this. It was called this. It was called this A attack and B attack. Okay. Attack from A, you end up with this here.
that is from A. Then attack from B, you get this. This attack from B. And A and B, therefore, will be enantiomer. Now, some of you will say, okay, we see our hydrogen attached to oxygen. Okay, keep in mind we have the bromide here somewhere. This bromide that we lost initially, right? This simply now comes here to abstract And so, therefore, you end up with this product. From A, so you end up with this product here. And similarly, you get a similar product from uh, from B, okay, as a result of abstraction of this proton here from the oxygen. So you also get a mirror image of this product here. Now the question is, what are the conditions for the SN1 reaction? How do you recognize an SN1 reaction? Now, before we go into that, now what is the rate law for this reaction? Because at this point, the point at which we are forming this carbocation here. This is what we call the rate limiting step. So what what would this uh, rate law look like? What will it look like? The rate law for this here. What will it look like? Will be constant. Will this rate law depend on the presence of the nucleophile or is this? Yes. Will it depend on the nucleophile? No. Because there is no nucleophile here. At this point, the nucleophile is not important. So the rate law depends only on the concentration of the substrate. So if we want this reaction to go, we know that what we need to do is to increase the concentration of the substrate. Because if you increase the concentration of the nucleophile, it doesn't affect it. Okay? Now, given what we just told you now, what will the reaction energy profile of this reaction look like? Okay? What will it look like? You got this? Okay. okay, reaction energy profile for SN1 reactions. Okay, reaction energy here, uh, reaction progress. Okay, so here, we start with the substrate. It goes through a transition state, and that transition state will collapse to form an intermediate. 
and then it goes to another transition stage before it comes to here. So what is, this is telling you here is that in the SM1 reaction, the carbocation is your is an intermediate. Okay, so you have here start with the substrate, and then you get to the transition state, and here you have the carbocation. So carbocation is your intermediate. carbocation intermediate in SN1 reactions. But in SN2 reaction, we have no intermediate. Okay? So now, so in this case, we have two transition states. Let us say TS1, and then a, a smaller transition state. But the transition state that determines the rate of the reaction is this one here, TS1. That is the difference between the energy of the substrate and the energy of the transition state. Okay, that is the energy of activation. Okay, in other words, once you reach that energy of uh, uh, activation, the reaction will go because this other transition state is very small. Okay, so therefore, this is your energy of activation here. And we could depict that as delta G transition state. Okay. And of course, this reaction is also an exogonic reaction because here, the product here, in this particular instance, since we're forming this type of product here, because here, keep in mind, now the nucleophile comes in now to attack the carbocation. Once you form the carbocation intermediate, that is when the nucleophile comes in to now form the product. Okay? So this is also <coughs> because of the difference in energy, the, start, the product has a lower energy than the starting material. We also refer to this as exergonic reaction. That is a reaction in which we are releasing energy at the end of the process. <coughs> now, what are the conditions for SN1 reaction? Very simple condition. Are you through with this? One, okay, tertiary substrate. Living group, must be attached to a tertiary carbon. Or, in the alternative, or okay, substrate can produce a stable carbocation. Okay. Okay. Either the living group is attached to a tertiary carbon, or the substrate, the starting material, could produce a, a stable carbocation. I will tell you. I will show you what I mean by that. Three. 
the nuclear fire is most likely a neutral species. A neutral Now, what do I mean by neutral species? For example, like water. No, charge. Like an alcohol. It could also be, for example, ammonia, sometimes. The point is, here is the nucleophile in the SM1 reaction is generally a fairly weak nucleophile, what we call a weak nucleophile. In other words, it is in charge. And then the final reaction condition I want to give you, the solvent, the solvent must be polar. It is a polar. Solvent and the solvent could be protic. In other words, protic meaning that it may it contain an acidic hydrogen. Okay, so these are the conditions for SN1, SN, yeah, SN1 reaction. Now, let me uh, <coughs> expand a little bit on this condition number two here. Substrate can produce a stable carbocation. Remember, we gave you the order of stability of carbocation some time ago. Just to refresh your mind, we told you that the tertiary most stable okay, this is tertiary more stable than secondary which will be this year more stable than primary this is primary carbocation of course that would be more stable than tertiary I mean uh, material this is the least stable Now the reason for this order of stability, if you take a look at this carbon here, let's take a look at the tertiary carbocation. Keep in mind, we told you that the carbocation is sp2 carbon. It is flat, okay? So, therefore, that sp2 carbon has a vacant p orbital, is vacant. Carbon is positively charged. Most at atoms do not want to either have positive charge or negative charge. They find a way to get rid of it. And then you see here, this carbon here is attached to this hydrogen. 
This is a sigma bond. Okay, and that sigma bond, if you recall chapters one and two, I'm sure most of you have forgotten now. <laughs> if you recall chapters one and two, this sigma bond, because this carbon you have been ST3 hybridized, you have this orbital here overlapping with this here, okay, to form a sigma bond. Now what is happening, if this carbon hydrogen bond, if it is parallel with this P orbital, okay, this sigma bond, if it could be parallel with this P orbital, then there will be some overlap of the orbitals so that this empty P orbital here is able to share some of the electron cloud in this sigma bond. And this, this phenomenon we refer to as hyper conjugation. So therefore, hyper conjugation is the overlap Upper conjugation is, let me write this and write it up here, so I'll give you a definition for this. Upper conjugation crossover overlap of P of sigma bond orbitals with is adjacent p orbital in this case of a carbocation of a carbocation Now, if this is possible, therefore, the more the more alkyl group you have attached to this, to this carbocation carbon, the greater the possibility of alpha conjugation. Because you could get alpha conjugation on this one of these hydrogens here. You could also get on one of these hydrogens here. So, therefore, that is why the tertiary carbon or the secondary carbon, a carbocation, will be more stable than the primary or the metal. Now another <coughs> another phenomenon that also stabilizes carbocation is resonance. Resonance. Supposing we have this carbocation here. <coughs> this would be a secondary carbocation. But it's just as stable as the tertiary carbocation because of resonance. Because you could delocalize this pi electron here to this carbocation carbon, okay? So we could write resonance for this in which we move this pi electron to here. Place the positive charge on this carbon. So we could continue to uh, delocalize the, the positive at uh, the electron so that the positive charge will simply move around the, this molecule here. So therefore, in this case, we could use resonance to stabilize a carbocation. So the point we made there, anytime you have resonance stabilization of a carbocation, it is possible, therefore, 
that that kind of molecule could undergo an SM1 reaction. Okay? Because since we are forming carbocation in SM1 reaction, yes. How does it work? How does it stable? How is it stable? stable? The more resonance structure you could draw for a molecule to uh, to to share all of the uh, in this case a positive charge to delocalize the positive charge over the range of carbons, then that molecule will be stable. The more resonance structure, the better. Okay. Particularly if you have resonance structures of uh, equal energy. So anyway, the point is. In addition to tertiary carbocation, this type of carbocation we call benzylic carbocation. In which what we have here, we have this carbon attached to benzene, that is called a benzylic carbocation. So, if you have a substrate, a living group attached to the benzylic carbon, it is possible that that will undergo SM1 reaction. In many cases, we will tell you whether this is SM1 reaction or SM2 reaction when you, know, you are dealing with a borderline situation and then ask you to give the mechanism for that reaction. Okay, so we see how some time here. Let me now go to elimination reactions. Here we see, I have plenty of time. Okay, you follow that. So SM1 reaction, you know, you know the condition for SM1 reaction. Either you have tertiary carbocation, I mean tertiary substrate, benzylic substrate, for example. This here. This would be a typical uh, SM1 reaction because even though that is not the tertiary carbocation, I mean tertiary substrate, it is a it is a benzylic substrate. Okay. This is a benzylic substrate because the intermediate carbocation could be stabilized by resonance. Okay, so let us uh, go to <coughs> the last uh, two other reaction mechanisms. Okay, the next set of mechanism is what we a reaction is what we call elimination reaction. <coughs> we look at this reaction here. What do we have here? We have an organo <coughs> organoelite. We have potassium hydroxide. For the most part, just think of this potassium hydroxide, mostly the hydroxide is what we need here. <coughs> And the solvent is ethanol. See what we get here. We get elimination product. We get two elimination product possibility. Either this here and this here. When it comes to elimination reaction, there is a rule in organic chemistry. We call the uh, zip cell. A rule, and that rule simply says in the elimination of antigen and a living group, this is your living group here, an antigen, from a substrate, the more highly substituted alkene is the major product. The more highly substituted alkene is the major product. That is the Z says uh, rule. So if you look, for example, at this reaction here, 
Now, by the way, when it comes to elimination reaction, the nucleophile will refer to the nucleophile as a base. Okay, so this is the nucleophile here, which is the toxin. We refer to the nucleophile as a base when it comes to elimination reaction. See what happens here. We say most of the product is this here. See what has happened? Let me number this carbon here. Say one, two, three, and four. So what has happened here? We eliminated hydrogen bromide from this molecule, and the hydrogen is coming from carbon number three, uh, for the bromine, and then we form this product here. The question is, how come we did not form how come we did not remove this hydrogen? Because this reaction is following the adjacent rule. In other words, whenever you are going to form an alkene, the more stable alkene will be the major product. And the more stable alkene is the one that is most substituted, OK? So in this case, we have a di-substituted alkene, OK, right here. The other possible product will be a mono-substituted alkene. The other product would possibly be this here. This is mono substituted. And this is di substituted. Now let us take a look at the mechanism for elimination reaction. Okay, here is the mechanism. This we call elimination by molecular reaction. The first set of methods we call it elimination by molecular reaction, E2 reaction. What, has, what is happening here? It's almost similar to what we get in the SN1 reaction. The difference here is this is elimination. See what is happening. The base, in this case, what we used to call the nucleophile, this base here, comes in to abstract this hydrogen here. As it is pulling this hydrogen away, breaking this hydrogen carbon bond, the carbon halogen bond is also breaking. So this is also a concerted reaction. So this is also a concerted reaction mechanism. Everything is happening at the same time. OK? And then you get this product here. So therefore, why do we call this E2 reaction? We call this E2 reaction because the step at which the base is pulling this hydrogen away and the living group is leaving to form the carbon-carbon double bond, that is the rate uh, limiting step. So therefore, the rate limiting step, in the rate limiting step, the base and the substrate are present. So the rate law for this, therefore, would be A constant multiplied by the product of the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of the base. So what this is saying is the rate of this reaction depends on the concentration of both the base and the substrate. So we call this an E2 reaction mechanism. Okay, so this is also a second order rate law. Now, if we draw the energy reaction energy profile for this reaction, would would they have an intermediate? Would they have an intermediate? No, there is no intermediate here. In the E two reaction, no intermediate.
reaction energy profile energy is here reaction progress so what you get is one transition state Okay, so you have here your substrate and your base. Both of them are present. Then the transition state right here. And the difference in energy between the transition state and your reactor right here. Okay, that's your delta G transition state, that is the energy of activation, that is the amount of energy that is required before this reaction can go. Now, <laughs> okay, one more point and then we leave, one more point we leave. No, oh, okay. No, when we come back, I will. <laughs> when we come back on Thursday, I will. Uh, I will finish up on this. And on Thursday, there will be a short ten minutes quiz. <laughs> okay. See you guys on Thursday. <laughs> Yes.